This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Grown-ups listening with children. Today's episode includes a conversation about illegal and smuggled drugs while discussing, of all things... Buddy, Holly, and a taxidermy bear, and the weirdest story I have ever heard in my life. And while I only run stories that I am comfortable letting my kiddo listen to, I'd also like to insert that my dad let us watch movies like Bloodsport when I was four, so I know my reality might be skewed. If you prefer to skip this conversation, it's the second segment of the show. And now, on with Bewilderbeasts. Hello and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today on Bewilderbeasts, we are going to talk about a superpower that's probably not going to make it into the Marvel Universe, why bears should not do illegal drugs, and the Untitled Goose Game should really look into history for making a new update to their awesome game for Switch. All right, let's go. All right, everybody, here we go. So before we get started, just a reminder, you can find Bewilder Beasts on YouTube now, just in case you'd like to listen to that platform, just search for Bewilder Beast Pod. And remember, leave a written review on iTunes before March 15th. There you will be entered into a random drawing for me to do a story of your choosing, a shout out on the show for you and a friend or both or whoever, and a Bewilder Beast sticker once I have them made up. So please consider going to iTunes this week and leave a quick few words to help get the word out about this little show. We are coming up on the one year anniversary of being home. When this pandemic started, it started with a phone call on my birthday, my 39th birthday, saying that my daughter would not be going to school for the next two days for deep cleaning. And before those two days were up, we got an update saying that she would be home for two weeks. And we are basically a year into two weeks of a shutdown that seems to never end. But the end is in sight thanks to these horseshoe crabs that have given us a vaccine, thanks to doctors and science and all of the cool people who have been there and doing all the work so we can get out. And a year seems like a really long time. And knowing that that anniversary is coming up on my birthday, it's a big one. It feels a little disappointing, but I know that the end is in sight. I know that a year is a long time. Guys, you've all been working really hard and and doing really hard things, and no one else in history has been asked to learn online for a year. This has been really, really hard on kids, on parents, on workers, but the end is in sight. And when I started this podcast, it was a way to keep things light and informative and trivia and to keep your mind off of it. And it seems like we're going to have to go for a little bit longer. And I don't know what's going to happen when we go back, if this podcast is going to continue or if it's going to continue in a different way. But until I get my vaccines, I am going to be sitting in this tiny little podcast studio continuing to talk to you and whoever will listen about these cool animals. And some of these stories might... You know, these are all stories that I feel comfortable sharing with my daughter, and I don't know if every parent feels the same way. I'm guessing not. Um, But if you are curious about these animals, I will keep going as long as you guys like this show. But for now, it is fun, and that is something that I do know, that this is fun, and I love doing these deep dives and, and surprising twists and turns into history and science and these cool animals. And now, on with the show. C. 
sea cucumbers. If you've ever been to a marine center, you might have even been up close and personal with one of these totally tubular, tuber-looking creatures. They look like a walking yam, and they have features with names like feeding tentacles, cloaca, and most varieties of sea cucumber have five rows of what are called tube feet. They're theoretically named sea cucumber for their likeness to the salad staple and 90s ID puffer, but I don't see it. Some theoretically look like caterpillars, others more like a walking sausage of sorts. But they also have a super special superpower, a superpower that is absolutely not going to make it into the Marvel Universe. When a sea cucumber pulls off his day clothes to reveal his superhero suit, he's revealing himself to be Captain Crap, the Stool Sultan, Mr. Manure, the Masked Excreter, Speedy McFeces, Dr. Deuce, the Super Pooper. They are the pooping champions of the sea. And why this is a legit superpower is even cooler. While they poop out 70,000 tons of sandy stool, some individual cukes can create 30 pounds of excrement every single year on their own. Why is this good? Well, think of sea cucumbers as the oceanic version of the everyday earthworm. Their poop produces calcium carbonate, a needed compound in making coral reef, while fertilizing the area and turning over the seafloor, very much like the happy helpers every spring up here on terra firma. Like worms who turn the soil, chickens who fertilize the ground and eat bugs that hurt gardens, pill bugs who eat dead vegetation and help the overall health of soil and more. Basically, without the numerous number two negotiators literally turning over the sea soil, the nutrients in the sand would just get trapped under sediment and the ecosystem could die. Corals wouldn't get the calcium carbonate that they need for their coral skeletons. And the entire domino effect that can come from these failing systems are catastrophic. We need these super poopers and seven species are already at risk of extinction. And while they are not the cutest creatures, they are necessary to heal and help the oceans with their magic, magic poop. So next time you squeeze one out, think of the tubular turtle, the sea cucumber. And then next time you see one at the marine center, an aquarium touch tank, or wherever you get access to these saltwater animals, thank him and his, well, service to all ecology. Guys, I'm so happy. I found another podcast called Southern Oddities, and they were talking about this particular story. So thank you to Southern Oddities for bringing this amazing story back to my attention. I had heard it once years ago, and I'm so glad that you reminded me of this. So if you get a chance and you like this kind of weirdness, check out Southern Oddities for a very short podcast on really cool historical weird stuff that happened in America's South. It's 1985. Birds are twittering, probably in Southern. At least that's how I picture it. And 84-year-old Fred Myers got up to shave. Everything was totally normal in this city, except for the dead guy in a parachute in his gravel driveway surrounded by 88 pounds of cocaine, which was valued at $15 million. He had knives, two pistols, night vision goggles, $4,500 in cash, which is like a bazillion dollars in today's money. Money. So much money. And a bulletproof vest. This will come back later. See? Everything's totally normal. I picture the kid on a bike delivering a newspaper. Off in his own little world, just tossing papers. Pedal, pedal, pedal. One paper hits a hedge. One paper hits a window. One paper hits a dead guy. Ring, ring on his little bike. Blows a double bubble in the double bubble gum and pedals away. Now that this is set up, are you ready for the weirdest story? Buckle in, let's go for a ride. So let's talk about the dead guy first, and I promise this does tie into an animal. You just have to kind of wait a few minutes for that reveal. So the dead guy had the most wealthy elite Kentucky name ever. Andrew Carter Thornton II. Not Junior, the second. And he was known to police because, well... He was police. 
Knoxville police, and I'm guessing a baker's dozen of drug detection dogs, then easily followed the trail of duffel bags and bricks of cocaine that they initially assumed were part of a flight path. Remember the parachute? Or the worst reboot of the Hansel and Gretel story ever. Each of these duffel bags were packed to the brim with bricks of cocaine. A tenth bag was found three months later in the woods. And not that far off was a dead 175-pound black bear who went out leaving Las Vegas style. All the cocaine in that tenth bag was gone. Don't do drugs, kids. Or bears. So the bear consumed 40 kilos of cocaine. 40 kilos. That's 76 pounds of drugs. No, 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 no. He ate the equivalent of a toilet or half a kangaroo or eight gallons of paint or a particularly funny comparison by the Measure of Things website, 40 kilos of cocaine is one-fifth as heavy as a cubic meter of snow. And if you're a kid laughing at that last joke, uh uh-oh. Quote, cerebral hemorrhaging, respiratory failure, hyperthermia, renal failure, heart failure, stroke. You name it, that bear had it, said the medical examiner in charge of the bear's necropsy. Probably also a list written in bear of really good ideas. Depending on the bear, he was either really happy and euphoric or just had the worst trip before his death, including hallucinations. You know, like hallucinations of a plane overhead dropping containers of cocaine in the Georgia woods. So how did all this coke end up in the Chattahoochee forest to begin with? And how on earth did a trained paratrooper and narcotics officer end up dead in a parachute in a driveway in Kentucky? Y'all, this tale has it all. Mostly irony. So remember Andrew Carter Thornton II, the guy found in the driveway a bulletproof vest surrounded by cocaine? Yeah, when he was younger, he joined the army as a paratrooper. You know, those are the guys who jump out of planes. He then joined the Lexington Police Force on the Narcotics Task Force. It was here that he decided to go to law school and start smuggling drugs. That doesn't seem very legal. He resigned from the police in 1977 and then practiced law. Guess what happens next? Yep, he broke the law. Almost immediately, in epic fashion. He was among 25 men who were caught for stealing weapons and planning on smuggling a 1,000 pounds of marijuana into the United States. He left after pleading not guilty, but was arrested in North Carolina with, you guessed it, a bulletproof vest and a pistol, but later sentenced to six months in jail, a $500 fine that he probably laughed at, and then turned his life around, decided to help the poor, donate a kidney, all that good stuff like that. Or not. He learned zero lessons, and immediately went all in. And in this one case, the thousand pounds of marijuana was actually a gateway drug, as the former narcotics cop thought the next best idea was to smuggle packages of cocaine from Colombia, the country, not the outdoor store. On one of these trips, he realized that his plane was too heavy, so he started dumping bricks of cocaine, starting it around Georgia, where a bear, minding his own business, may be wondering if there's more to life than this, and Why is life just a series of days where you poop in the woods and no one believes you? Rub your back up against a tree and find berries. Maybe scare some kids for fun. You know, mix it up a bit. When cocaine bricks fell from the sky and he went on a bender to end all bear benders. The plane, leaving on autopilot, continued on as Thornton II strapped on a parachute like the good old days in the army, a bulletproof vest because that's his move, a bunch of guns, night vision goggles, knives, and don't forget the almost a toilet weight in cocaine packed in a duffel bag. I would also just assume he was wearing army camo cargo pants because, I mean, look at him. And I'm not kidding. Gucci loafers. Because every time I'm breaking the law in the international level, I want to both dress functionally in toxic masculinity attire and my fanciest loafers for a quick getaway. He then leapt from the plane and hit his head on the tail of the aircraft on his way down. The parachute was then twisted, likely from a tree canopy, and he then free fell to the ground, ending up in the driveway of poor Fred Myers, who only wanted to shave his face. The plane was eventually discovered and crashed in yet another state. North Carolina. 
After the medical examiner was done, the bear had a visit with a taxidermist and then was sold to Waylon Jennings. Who's he? Well, every child from 1984, he's the guy who wrote the Dukes of Hazzard theme song and famously had a cocaine addiction that he kicked in 1984, the year before the bear died of a cocaine overdose. Waylon Jennings was also known as the super, super nice guy who was supposed to be on a charter plane instead of a bus while on tour with a few famous people of the day. He decided to instead take the bus and he gave up his seat on the plane to give it to J.P. Richardson, one of the performers that he was traveling with who was suffering from the flu. So traveling to the next city would have been unbearably uncomfortable for J.P. Waylon's roommate, Buddy, started to tease him. Oh, I hope your old bus freezes, he said, to which Waylon joked back, well, I hope your old plane goes down. Ha ha, see you in Iowa tomorrow, as he boarded a bus. He later learned that Richie Valens, J.P. Richardson, a.k.a. the Big Bopper, and Buddy, Holly, died in a plane crash an hour and a half later when the plane crashed at full throttle into a cornfield, a flight that he was supposed to be on. It was even initially reported that Waylon was on the flight because they didn't know that he gave up his seat at the last minute to the Big Bopper. He had to call his family to tell him, no, he was still very much alive and very much in shock as this tragedy gutted the nation and Waylon. So Cocaine Bear, a bear who died when illegal drugs flew out of a plane, was first purchased by Waylon Jennings. I'm sure there's not a weird metaphor here. Waylon then gave the bear to a guy in Las Vegas who was apparently familiar with Andrew Carter Thornton, the second, who after his death, the bear was then sold to a Chinese herbalist in Reno. Because of course he was. This sounds like maybe an extension of the hallucinations the bear had before he died, but this is apparently the journey the stuffed bear went on, and after the herbalist passed away, his widow just gave the bear to Witt Heiler and Griffin Van Meter, the, uh, heroes of this story? See, apparently Griffin and Witt had been tracking down the whereabouts of cocaine bear since 2011. They needed this bear to help make Kentucky be more cool, more hip, more funny cocaine story-y without the actual hard illegal drugs. They opened the now-famous Kentucky for Kentucky Fun Mall. They thought that this bear might be a good addition in a conversation starter piece, and it is. Quote, You wouldn't think that a cocaine bear would be for all ages, but the kids love it, said Cocaine Bear's now owner, Griffin Van Meter. Everyone wants their picture with Cocaine Bear. I mean, no lies detected. I want my picture with Cocaine Bear. They wanted Cocaine Bear to help draw people to their warehouse of fun, all things Kentucky and Bazaar. They got their KY shirts, KY socks, KY hats, and fried chicken candles. And it worked. If you love Kentucky or want some merch of Cocaine Bear, or as his friends call him, Pablo Escobar, after the infamous drug lord Pablo Escobar, you can visit ky4ky.com. In a final twist of irony, the bear is now living his best afterlife, residing at this mall, taking photos with kids, wearing kitschy hats, and driving Kentucky tourism, all in a former parachute factory. Full disclosure, I only took enough Italian to get by to, like, find my hotel and know where the nearest bar was when I went in 2003. It's been a minute since I've even looked at Italian, so I'm going to get the pronunciations of these wrong, and I never took Latin. So, bear with me. If these names are wrong and you happen to have studied the classics, I'm so sorry, and and I know I have a lot of friends from college who did. Did you know Rome was saved by a flock of angry birds? The Celtic group called the Senwans had just invaded northern Italy. They must have really liked the view and just decided to settle there. But the people of Closium, an Italian people, decided to ask neighboring Rome to help settle the settlers' dispute as they were afraid that the Senwans would attack or sack or slaughter or all those things that most people living in a place would be afraid of if invaders came in and took over land. You know... What Rome was literally doing to everyone at the time. Well, it turns out that the Clusium folk did not understand irony. Anyway, three sons of Rome's big daddy aristocrat were sent to negotiate with the settling Senwans, but they were supposed to remain impartial, 
not take sides between the Sanwans and the Clusians. They talked about what they wanted. The Senwan said that they wouldn't attack Clusium if they could just get some land of their own. I mean, it's Italy, man. It's warm. It's stunning. It's a beautiful country. I also just want to be there. All the time. I can't blame them. Anyway, things seemed to be going well until the negotiations took a sharp left turn when one of the sons sent to help straight up murdered one of the Senwan's leaders. In one article, they said that this was a violation. Yeah, killing a dude is absolutely a violation. I think what they meant was, in killing the chieftain, it was a violation in that Rome brothers took sides in the dispute. But regardless if the issue was if they took sides or killed a man, they still killed a Celtic chieftain out of anger. And at this time, the Sun Ones left to talk things over calmly and discuss what action to take. They calmly decided to call their buddies and ravage the city of Rome. And they would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for a flock of jerk geese. Because, well, history. The Sun Ones had between 12,000 and 70,000 men, depending on the source. And the Romans had 9,000 to 35,000. You know, history. History is storytelling with hopefully facts, and we do the best we can with the information we have. And I, as a descendant of the Celts, am absolutely prone to storytelling and know full well that these numbers are either really inflated or in the context of what someone's aunt saw crossing a bridge, plus the actual historical data of the numbers of military persons who were of age at the time. Which puts the Romans closer to 9,000 men because at the time people didn't think women could do anything. And they were basically just peasant farmers looking for a part-time gig. They would run off, do war things, and then come back and harvest. The Celts, however, had maybe 12,000 men. Which was a very large and generous estimate given the size of the tribes. But the Celts were known to make friends with other Celtic tribes, band together for battle, and then go their separate ways. I mean, what else are you going to do on a Sunday? So the Romans killed their chieftain in a peace talk because of the swiftness of their actions and a whole lot of, we're not taking this well, decided to march towards Rome. And whatever army Rome had, mostly a part-time military on sabbatical, the farmers, the peasants, the everyone marched to meet the Celts and they intersected at the Alia. As the San Juan attacked, one wing of the Roman flank was so over this that they literally threw down their weapons and basically ran for the Tiber River which would have worked out well for the fleeing farmers, except for they were in their armor and drowned in the river. Turns out metal doesn't float. Well, the Celts charged and the Roman army fell apart, which left Rome, you know, Rome, completely undefended. The Sen ones and a few thousand buddies then rolled into Rome, demanding that the three brothers were given to them because, yo, you killed our chieftain during a peace negotiation. The Roman Senate, now caught between a very rightfully angry Celtic group and the powerful family of which the three Roman brothers hailed, decided, cowardly, to just let the people choose because no one will be happy no matter what we choose. So the Celtics slaughtered most of the Senate, took the city, and it was at this point the writers of the day thought that Rome, the empire of Rome itself, was lost and had fallen. However, while the rest of the city had fallen to the Celts, including the famous Roman Senate, there was one exception, Capitoline Hill, which the Romans defended vigorously. The Senwan troops decided to climb the hill fortified by the remainder of the Roman army during the night, but disturbed a sacred flock of geese that lived at the Temple of Juno on that hill. Their honking was loud enough to alert the Roman guards, who were then able to defend the hill, either by fighting, by kicking, by mighty swordsmanship, by insulting, by sheer luck and gravity, depending on the source. All of these sources are biased and completely, absolutely likely true to the person dictating the events. These guards were able to save the city thanks to the geese. The details that are consistent across all the storytellings I could find of the available historical text regarding the Battle of Alia. One twit brother killed a Celtic chieftain in a peace talk. The Celts marched swiftly to Rome because, dude, you killed our chieftain. There was a whole lot of slaughter. The city of Rome nearly fell apart to a very upset, rightfully so, group of Celts 
Whoever was left fled to a hill, and that hill happened to be the home of a bunch of geese who were revered and considered holy as they lived at the Temple of Juno Moneta, the money-making monastery. Dollar dollar bills, y'all. But also was home to a flock of sacred geese. Geese gonna geese, y'all, and these geese are gonna get their honk on. The Celts came up the hill three to four days after they easily took Rome by surprise and were defeated because the geese woke up these guards on a minor hill. This hill wasn't Mount Everest. I mean, some say it had a cliff-like feature. Others say it was a small hill. History is hard, y'all. But either way, high ground attacks beat the Celts who were hungry, now sick, and probably dehydrated and literally goosed by the remaining Romans. The Romans, just wanting this all over with, as it's not a good look to lose your city when it's entirely your fault, or they were told you literally pay for the death of our chieftain, gave up those dollar dollar bills, though really Roman Roman bills, to pay off the Celts. And when the Romans realized how much money it would take to make them leave, assuming the Celts were also weighting the scales in an unfavorable manner, the Celt leader, so over this, just decided to throw his sword on the bundles of money on the scale, crying, V Victus, or Woe to the Vanquished. Basically, this was old-timey for... So sad for you. You lost. Get over it. The Celts took the money, left the city, and Rome fell fully within the century. And if you've played the Untitled Goose game on the Switch, as an adult, I find it quite cathartic. You're a goose. Your entire objective is to cause mayhem, and if you honk, cause panic. And you get to rage enough humans you can advance up to the boards and all through the levels. It's simple. It's fun. It's super cathartic. And living next to geese in a city, they're totally based on real-life geese. And I can absolutely see how these holy geese saved the Roman city in the 390s. Clearly, they needed more of them less than 100 years later when the Germans finished the job. Hey, Untitled Goose Game, I think I have an idea for an update for your game. So thanks for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you like this podcast, you know what to do by now. Share and tell all of your friends. It's truly the best way to support this show. If there are topics that you're interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, there are multiple ways to send them in or let me know what you think of the show. Visit the website, bewilderbeastpod.com. There you can find episodes to start with, share episodes, learn about the show, how to support the show, and see bonus art for some of the podcast episodes. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet bewilderbeastpod. You can DM or voice text at bewilderbeastpod on Facebook. This is especially cool for little kids who want to converse with the show. The voice text feature allows a person to leave a one-minute voice message on their favorite animal fact or resource for the show. Or you can lurk at Bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of Mutt Stuff Media and this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information from wikipedia.org on Sinwans and the Battle of Alia, npr.org on the sacred geese that saved Rome, Wikipedia on Andrew C. Thornton II, RoadsideAmerica.com, My Favorite Murder Minisode 101, Not for Kids, on Cocaine Bear, Time.com, Kentucky.com, Mirror.co.uk, and special thanks to Southern Oddities Podcast at Southern Odd Pod on Twitter for their episode on Cocaine Bear, which I highly recommend. And Live Science on Sea Cucumbers Poop. Lastly, I'd like to recommend a YouTube video in today's episode links. It's a three-minute animation on the battle. It's totally kid-safe, and it was really helpful for me, somebody who never, ever, ever studied ancient history. And it's by Ancient History Guy on the Battle of Alia, A-L-L-I-A. Or Alia. I've said it both ways. I'm sure one or both are wrong links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next week.